Hey, this is Mel Strong, and this lecture is on fronts and mid-latitude cyclones. Now, in previous lectures, we've been talking about how we can create clouds and precipitation through convection. So in that story, we've got a little parcel of air, it's warmer than its environment, and it wants to rise, and as it rises, it expands, and as it expands, it cools, and eventually, it will reach its dew point and form a cloud. If it keeps on going, then eventually you can get precipitation. Okay, there's a whole completely different way to make clouds and precipitation, and it comes from the collision of these large, what we call air masses. So here's a map that you often see in a textbook of air masses, and what they're trying to show here is that air that sits over a particular region uh, will take on certain characteristics. And we talked about this a little bit uh, when we were back talking about humidity, that if you had a blob of air sitting over the continent, it's probably very dry, whereas a blob of air that's sitting over the ocean can pick up a lot of uh, water from evaporation. Well, not only is there that variable, but it also depends on the temperature and uh, where it is. So for example, up here, MP stands for maritime polar. This is maritime tropical. This is maritime equatorial. So these are all blobs of air that are sitting over the ocean, but as we learned, when we, uh, in the lecture on evaporation, if you're sitting over warmer water, there's a higher evaporation rate into the, uh, the air mass. So the air mass, this air mass is going to have a higher dew point than, say, this air mass. And we have, for example, CP is continental polar, CA is continental arctic. We're not really going to get into the, the names uh, too much in this class. But the point is, is Air that's sitting over, say, this region, which is going to be cold and dry, may mingle with air that's sitting over this region, which is warmer and more humid. And when these two things interact with each other, uh, you're going to get some very interesting weather as a result. Now, it's a little misleading, uh, I think, this, this diagram, because a lot of people might walk away thinking that there's a blob of air sitting over here all the time called MT for Maritime Tropical, but this is just represents sort of average conditions, and these air masses are always moving around all the time. It's, this is just trying to show that air that sits over here typically has certain characteristics that are different than air that, say, sits over here. Okay, that's all that really means. So we're going to start today at earth.nullschool.net, and I'm going to change the overlay to temperature. And what I'm looking at right now is surface temperature, and I'm doing this on a day that's in the winter in the northern hemisphere. So what I see, these, this blue and purple, this is really cold air right here. And so we've got cold air that's sitting over the continents, it looks like, right? That's kind of what we would expect. We've got cold air over Siberia and Alaska. And notice the pretty sharp change in temperature, the contrast in temperature between the air over the continent and the air over the ocean. So right now, in northern hemisphere winter, the ocean is much warmer than the continent. Okay. Now if we did this in the summer, we would see it's probably going to need to be the opposite. The continent will be much warmer than the ocean. And the reason for this is that the ocean has a very high, what we call heat capacity. So what that means is it takes a lot of energy to change the temperature of the ocean. So it's, it takes a long time for the ocean to warm up. And then once it's warm, it takes a long time for the ocean to cool down. So the ocean's temperature is always out of sync with the continents. And that's what we're seeing here. Okay, so what I'm gonna do though is, that, so this is all surface temperature. And, and I'm interested in showing you what the temperature is like up in the uh, upper parts of the atmosphere. So I'm gonna click the word Earth, and over here where it says height, there are these numbers, 1,850, 700. The units are HPA. So that's a unit of air pressure, and we learned this one back in the lecture on air pressure. I'm gonna change it to 700 HPA. So what that means is, if you went up in the, in the atmosphere in a balloon till you reached a level where the air pressure was 700 millibars, what would the temperature up there be like? Now, how high is that, give or take about it's about 10,000 feet above the ground. Just kind of think of that, right? So we're just kind of looking at what the temperature is like 10,000 feet above the ground or so. And you'll notice how different the pattern looks compared to what we just saw. 
For one thing, we don't see the big contrast be between the oceans and the continents anymore. And we see that for the most part, if I zoom out a little bit, if I kind of look around the, the middle of the Earth, I see that the temperatures around here don't change that much. And then when you get further to the north or the south, you suddenly hit this much colder blob of air up there. And it's a pretty sharp contrast. So in other words, it should not be surprising that the equator is hot and the poles are cold. But what you might expect to see is that from the hottest point on Earth, it gradually gets colder as you move to the north, or gets colder, with gradually gets colder as you move to the south. But what this is showing us is actually there's very little change in temperature. Again, remember, we're at least 10,000 feet above the ground here when we're looking at this. So there's very little change in temperature. And then all of a sudden, we hit this boundary as pretty sharp, where we go from the warm air to the cold air very abruptly. So there's not a gradation, okay? So that's the first observation. Second observation is the boundary between the cold air and the warm air is curvy, right? So if I look at the North Pole, I can see it's got these waves in it. And I'm gonna turn around and look at the South Pole because there's another one down there. It's a little bit easier to see this time of year. Okay, so this boundary between the warm air and the cold air, it's called the polar front, okay? It's always there. It's always there in the summer and in the winter, but right now it's their summer down in the southern hemisphere. So their pool of cold air is smaller, and it's winter up here in the northern hemisphere, so our pool of cooled air is, uh, is larger. And if we did this in the summer, those two things would be reversed. So what I'm going to do here is, let me go back to the southern hemisphere because it's easy to see. Okay, so I'm going to go forward in time a little bit here. So day, later, one day later, one day later, one day later. Each one of these is one day later. And you'll notice that uh, this, cold, this blob of cold air is slowly rotating around the Earth. So every 24 hours, it's changing its shape. And there are these, you know, there's parts that kind of break off a little bit. And overall, it still kind of, you know, keeps this, it's, it's staying in the same area but the actual outline of it is changing slowly day to day, okay? And these waves that we see that are in this blob of cold air are called Rosby waves. So you can see, especially in the Northern Hemisphere here, I've got these waves, okay? And we go back in time a couple of days. If I go back in time a day and a day, you can see these waves are changing their shape, okay? So the point is we've got this blob of cold air that is slowly moving around the poles of the planet. And so the, the planet's rotating 24 hours a day, but, and this blob of cold air takes, you know, 10 or so days to make a full revolution all the way around the Earth. Now, right here at this boundary between the, the, the warm air and the cold air, this is where we're, we're mixing up two completely different kinds of air masses. This is cold, dry air. This is warmer, more humid air. And that boundary is, is what we're talking about today. That front, what we're calling the polar front, uh, where these two air masses meet, we're going to get some interesting types of weather. Now, if I find a zone here... Okay, so now I've changed it back to uh, today with winds. And... I'm looking at out here in the Pacific and I notice for example this spot right here so the winds are spinning counterclockwise right here we're in the northern hemisphere so that tells you that I must have a center of low pressure right there okay now if I can zoom out a little bit here you can kind of make out the fact that we're taking air that's from the north and it's cold and it's coming down and then we're taking air that's warmer and more humid from the south, and it's coming up. And these two things are mixing up together in this big spiral pattern. Okay, This is what we mean when we talk about air masses colliding. We have two very different air masses, and this low pressure center is mixing them up, them up together. Now I'm going to change this. Instead of temperature, I'm going to change it to 
uh, look at moisture. So TPW means total precipitable water. And this just looks at all the water that's in the atmosphere. Now it's a little bit more evident that we're mixing up different types of air. So very cold, very dry air coming off the continent, warmer, more humid air coming from the south, and we're mixing these two things together. I can turn off the wind here a little bit. So you can see that right there, we're mixing it up. We got a low uh, center of low pressure right there. Here's another one. We're mixing up again, warm, humid air with cold, dry air. And this is what happens along the polar front. We're mixing up two very different air masses. And right through here, we've got the invasion. If you kind of imagine what's happening here, I've got cold air coming down, invading the warm air. And then I've got the warm air coming up and invading the cold air, right? And so these two things are two different kinds of fronts. Overall, the polar front is the name we gave to those that wavy blob. But we can break it down further because here we got cold, dry air invading warm, humid air. And then up here we've got warm, humid air invading cold, dry air. So we turn the winds back on here. So here's, you, here's where the cold, dry air is invading the warm air they meet. And then this is where that warm, humid air meets the, dry, the cold, dry air. Okay, so these are going to form two different kinds of fronts. So we're going to be looking at what happens where these two different types of air invade each other. So the first one we're going to look at is what happens where the warm air invades the cold air. So if that happens, and we let's say we make a cross section of the atmosphere, so we're looking at it from the side, we would expect that the warm air would be coming somewhere from the south in our part of the world. So over here is the warm air, and it's headed towards the north. It's invading, okay? And to the north, we have the cold air that's sitting there. So when we talked about convection, what we said was if I have a parcel of warm air, it will rise because it's warmer than the air around it, which is due to density differences. Now here what we're doing is we're forcing warm air to collide with the cold air, but the, they still have that same density difference. The cold air is more dense, the warm air is less dense. So what happens is, if I try to shove warm air into cold air, it's gonna to wanna to ride up over the cold air. And so that's what happens, but it kind of forms this very low angle ramp. So when the warm air encounters the cold air, so, so just to be clear, this is cold air down here in this wedge. The warm air then rises up this ramp. It's a very low angle ramp, maybe just a, a degree or two, and it goes on for perhaps hundreds of miles. Okay, this is a very large feature. Well, this air, as it goes up the ramp, is rising. And anytime you make air rise, it expands and expanding air cools and eventually you'll hit the dew point and then you get a cloud. So that's what's gonna to happen to this blob of warm air that's down here. It's gonna go up this ramp and as it goes up the ramp, it's going to cool more and more. So all the way out here at the edge, the top of the ramp, we would have some very high wispy clouds, which we know are cirrus. And then they get a little bit thicker and more of a blanket. And that's what we would call cirrostratus. And then they get thicker still. And that we would call altostratus, right? And then Further back on this wedge, we're getting a, a thicker and thicker chunk of air. And eventually they would be so thick that we would not be able to see the cloud, uh, sorry, wouldn't be able to see the sun, that's stratus. And then from behind that point, if it's a well-developed, if this whole thing is pretty well-developed, we would have precipitation coming out of this. And at that point, we've got nimbostratus.
okay? Now, this whole thing, not only is the warm air riding up over the cold air, but the actual wedge itself is also moving. So this, everything in this picture, the way I've drawn it, is moving to our right here, okay? Well, this spot right here, where the warm air meets the cold air, that is called a warm front, okay? And it's a, called a warm front because, let's say you're right here, and you are going to experience this whole thing. When this ramp gets to you and passes over you, the experience is that the temperatures increase. Because this air back here is warmer than the air that you're currently sitting in. So uh, in a warm front, the temperatures will increase as it goes by. All right, so let's think about the series of events that would happen here. If you're out here, and this warm front is approaching you. Now, to get from, from this point to this point might take, you know, 24 hours, could be more, could be less. But let's just say that you're, let's just say this, this whole thing takes, uh, let's say, a day and a half, okay? So you're standing out here, and this warm front approaches. It's the 1800s, and you don't have any electricity, there's no weather stations, nothing like that. And you're on your horse, and you look up, and you see wispy clouds in the sky, okay? And then maybe four to six hours later, you see cirrostrats. Remember what that looks like? It's a ring around the sun. Okay, so you went from wispy clouds to ring around the sun, and then if it's still daylight, fuzzy sun, and then later, no sun, okay? So if you notice that pattern, cirrus to cirrostratus to altostratus to stratus, there's a good chance that it is going to rain in the next, say, 24 hours. So people started to notice this pattern. They started to notice that if you saw this and you saw this and you saw this, it leads to rain. So there is some folklore in certain parts of the world that say that if you see a ring around the sun, it's going to rain. This is where it comes from. That is true for a warm front, okay? Now, as we'll talk about in a little bit, warm fronts don't occur everywhere in the world. They occur along that polar front, that zone between the warm air and the cold air, the thing with the, the Rosby waves. If you live in that area, that's true. Ring around the sun, often does mean it's going to rain. But you can get a ring around the sun in a lot of different places in the world and not have a warm front, so that doesn't totally hold true, okay? But that's where it comes from. Okay, so this whole thing, again, in this scenario, is moving past you. Maybe it takes a day and a half or so to get from this point to this point. So your experience would be zero, zero stratus, all the stratus, stratus, and then rain maybe as much as 24 hours, okay? Now, that spot right there is the warm front, that, that spot. And we can put that spot on a map. So to show a warm front on a map, we'll have a line with these humps. Okay, so this is a warm front. And the warm air is back here. And the cold air is on the other side. Okay, so the warm air is behind the humps and it's moving in the direction of the humps. Okay, so this is the, the, the literal point on the ground that we had where the wedge meet the surface in that previous diagram. Okay, so the warm air is coming along, it hits this cold air and it ramps up over it. So what that means is that right ahead of, let's see, right here, somewhere ahead of this would be our cirrus clouds. And then behind that, they get thicker and we get the cirrostratus, right? And then the altostratus and all that. But it's a big band, okay? It's a big band ahead of this warm front. 
So eventually, if you're looking at this from space, and we'll see one in a second, you'll see the cirrus as kind of a fuzzy edge, and then it gets solid white up until you get to where the warm front passes. Now, a couple other things. Think about dew point for, for a minute. You got warm air and cold air. The warm air has come from the south. It probably came from an ocean. So the dew points are probably higher. And the cold air, as we know, the dew points are lower. So as this warm front passes over you, you know, if you're if you're out here and you're seeing that sequence of clouds as this thing is approaching you, the other thing that changes is when this passes over you, your temperatures go up and your dew points will also go up. Okay, so that is a warm front. So now let's imagine what happens where the cold air invades the warm air. Okay, same kind of scenario, except now what's going to happen is we've got warm air over here, and we've got cold air over here, but the cold air is now invading the warm air. Okay, so it's coming and colliding with the warm air. Now, the cold air is more dense, and it tends to kind of hug the ground, so kind of like this. So it's, it's going to basically tunnel underneath that warm air, and it's going to throw the warm air up out of the way. So you got cold air coming down, tunneling underneath the warm air, shoving it up out of the way, and one of the things that you're going to get right here, right where that cold air meets the warm air, is very likely cumulonimbus, or at least cumuliform clouds. So I'll draw some cumulonimbus here. So this rolls through, shoves warm air up out of the way, the warm air rises in, in these little pockets and gives you cumulonimbus. And then what happens is as this thing passes, you know, if this is pretty cold air and the ground was kind of warm that it rolled over, you've got little plumes of warm air rising up through the cold air and you will get all kinds of cumulonimbus forming in the back as this cold air uh, rolls through. So, this point right here, that is the cold front. And if you were here, and a cold front is coming towards you, your experience is that you don't really, exp nothing really happens until the front hits you. And when the front hits you, boom, you have cumuliform clouds. So it could be cumulus, could be towering cumulus, could be cumulonimbus. It could be, a, it could be a, a line of very severe thunderstorms if you live in certain areas. And then as this cold uh, front passes over you, this blob of cold air moves past you, your temperature suddenly drops. Okay, so that's what we call it a cold front. And, just to remind you of what we said last time, so we've got low dew points here. So, cold air is always dry air. As this rolls past you, not only does your temperature drop, but very likely the dew point also drops. So this is, so in a warm front then, we get the stratiform clouds. In a cold front, we get more cumuliform clouds. So on a map, the cold front, if it's in color, is in blue, but either way, you're looking for a line with triangular teeth. And the triangular teeth indicate a cold front. Air behind the triangular teeth is where the cold air is. And on the other side is the warm air. And the cold air is moving in the direction that the teeth are pointing. Okay, So that's a cold front. And if you can't remember which is which, and if it's black and white, what I tell when I teach this to kids, I tell them that the cold air is biting cold. That's why the cold front has teeth. If it helps you remember, great. Uh, there is another type of front where the two air masses actually come up against each other, but neither one wins. 
it's called a stationary front. I'm going to draw that real quick. So in a stationary front, you've got teeth on one side, and then you've got humps on the other side. Okay, so the same rules apply. The warmer is behind the humps, and the cold air is behind the teeth. And at least at this point in time, neither one is really taking over the other. That's called a stationary front. So warm fronts and cold fronts usually occur together near the same place along the polar front. And we call that a mid-latitude cyclone. So by mid-latitude cyclone, what we mean is not low latitudes like the equator, and not really high latitudes like the poles, but somewhere in the middle. And cyclone is another word for storm. So you can think of this as a storm that occurs in the mid-latitudes, kind of along the polar front. So we're going to go through the stages of how one of these form and how they evolve and then eventually die. So it starts out with essentially a stationary front along the polar front. So what we have is we've got cold air to the north. So we're you know drawing this uh, from a northern hemisphere perspective, right? So um, if this was in the southern hemisphere, everything would be flipped. Uh, so we've got the cold air up here. We've got the warm air down here. And right now, neither one is invading the other, so we have a stationary front. But it won't stay that way for long because um, you've, the cold air side usually has air or winds that are coming down from the east, and the warm typically kind of has westerlies. So you've got the situation where you have two different kinds of air masses which have different densities going past each other in different directions, and that's not a very stable setup. And what's going to happen is that there will be waves that develop in this boundary. And once we start to develop a wave, we start to make a mid-latitude cyclone. So we'll make a slight wave in that, uh, in that front, and we're going to, uh, we're going to form a mid-latitude cyclone. Okay, so we start to develop a cold front on the west side of it and a warm front on the east side of it. And so now we've got kind of this, let me draw these guys in here. We've got a counterclockwise rotation that's starting to set up here. And in the center of a counterclockwise rotation in the northern hemisphere is a low. So I'm going to draw it. There's a center of low pressure kind of right between those two fronts. Now, why is the pressure low? Because air is rising. Why is air rising? Well, in this one, you've got, remember, the ramp. So you've got warm air ramping up, rising up over the cool air in front of it. Here, you've got cold air tunneling underneath the warm air and pushing it up out of the way. In both cases, air is rising. So this whole thing, air is rising, but the, the center of, of low pressure is right in between it, those two types of fronts. All right, so now what's going to happen is the storm intensifies and this uh, counterclockwise motion is going to continue. So you're going to get something that kind of has this shape. So the cold front is sweeping around. And then the warm front is kind of arching up. Now, think of everything we said earlier about a warm front and a cold front, like all the clouds and all that stuff. That's happening all the warm front stuff is happening over here. All the cold front stuff is happening over here. 
Now, in our part of the world, when one of these forms, this whole thing is also moving to the east. So you have to imagine as we're drawing this that there's two things happening. One is you've got counterclockwise rotation. So the fronts themselves are starting to twist around the center of this. And the other thing that's happening is this whole business is moving as it's twisting. Okay, so that's the motion of a mid-latitude cyclone. So as the storm intensifies, what happens is the cold front moves faster than the warm front and it catches up to it. So it looks something like this. And this is the cold front. And this is the warm front. So now this, this cold front has wrapped all the way around and is caught up to the warm front and it tunnels underneath the warm front. And so that gets a special name. We put a hump and a tooth on each side and that is called an occluded front. Okay, so again, that cold air, when it's wrapping around, is moving faster than the warm air. It wraps around, catches up to it, tunnels underneath. Now we've got three different fronts here. The warm front, the cold front, and this occluded front, which is really two fronts on top of each other. Now at this point, the storm is at its peak uh, energy. Okay, so the, the storm is the strongest. But once the front starts to occlude, then it's kind of like this whole thing zips up. And as it zips up, it shuts itself off. So when the occlusion happens, the storm is the strongest. We would say it's in its mature state. And the end is near, okay? So I'll say end is near. Once this happens, then it, the end is within, you know, probably a, a day or two. So the steps from initiation to here depends on lots of factors, but roughly one of these things lasts five days, seven days, something like that. So it'll form, it'll go through these stages, then these, these two fronts kind of zip together and it shuts itself off. And then another one forms, okay? That's the life of a mid-latitude cyclone. Now, what we're gonna do is talk about what it would be like to live through a mid-latitude cyclone. So let's put, put a fairly mature mid-latitude cyclone here. Let's do it this way. Okay, so there's my warm front. And here's my cold front. Oops, change my color. Okay. Now, you live here. And we're going to talk about what it would be like if one of these formed and then moved past you, over you. Now, as this is happening, this thing is rotating counterclockwise. This front is going to catch up to that front, and this whole thing is on the move. But for to simplify things, let's just assume that the fronts stay just like they are, but this whole thing is going to move as is across and pass over you. Okay, we're going to talk about what you would see and what you would notice. Now, as the storm approaches, realize that we're going to see events that are from the warm front first, then there's a gap, and then events from the cold front next. So that's one thing to keep in mind. The other thing to keep in mind is that this L, the center of low pressure, as it moves towards us, the distance between us and the L is decreasing. So what does that mean? That means the air pressure that we experience as this gets closer to us is going down.
And then at some point that L will pass by, and then as it moves on, we will get farther from the L and our pressure will go back up. Okay, so there's gonna be a change in pressure uh, in addition to all the changes in clouds and everything else here. So we're gonna kind of write down the list of events. So, it's 1800s, you're out on a horse, you're out here, you have no idea what's going on in terms of the weather, but this thing is approaching you. And, and so we're gonna think in terms of like what that person would see. Okay, so first thing, what are they gonna notice? Well, ahead of, what's ahead of the warm front? The first thing that happens ahead of the warm front are the cirrus clouds, right? So you see the cirrus clouds and then that transitions to your cirrostratus, then your aldostratus, then your stratus. Okay, so we're gonna assume that this is kind of like a pretty big, pretty big storm. Okay, so I'm gonna assign some kind of arbitrary times to this. But let's just say that this right here is about 12 hours. Okay, so as you're watching this, this whole thing is on the march towards you, right? So then, what finally gets to you, what comes after stratus? The nimbostratus, okay? So that gets to you next, and you're in precipitation. Now what kind of precipitation is it? It's kind of a, it's like a slow and steady rain. So I'm gonna write down steady precip. Now, rain or snow, could be either. How long does it rain? So, if you're from New Mexico, you might want to sit down for this because it's going to be hard to wrap your mind around. You can get 24 hours or more of steady precipitation. Okay, I know that freaks people out. But let's just say that in this scenario, this person's going to get about 24 hours of constant steady rain. It's not a downpour usually. It's not like a thunderstorm where it just rains really hard. It's, it's a more of a steady, slow and steady type of precipitation. Okay, so if you imagine, if you can visualize this whole thing traveling, okay, after 24 hours of precipitation, that warm front is now right up to where you are, okay? But as this has happened, there's another thing that to keep in mind. It's also been happening ever since step number one, which is this low pressure center has been getting closer to you. So the air pressure that you experience down here on the ground is decreasing. So during this whole stage, I'm gonna put number three, but it's happened since the very beginning, is the air pressure from your perspective, oops, is decreasing. So in old school barometer talk, that means that that mercury column is going down. So if our farmer in the 1800 has one of those, what they would say is that the, the barometer is falling. Okay, that refers to that dropping column of mercury. All right, so uh, we're, now, we're now up to a day and a half, right? 12 hours of changing clouds, 24 hours of precipitation. That whole time, the air pressure has been decreasing, the barometer has been dropping. But now, this front is right to your doorstep. So what happens? Well, the warm front passes. So what's that like? Temperatures are gonna go up. So if you think back to the ramp, the bottom of the ramp now is, is passing over us and we're in the warmer pool of air behind it. So our dew points are gonna be up too. Okay. Now, from your perspective, it seems like the storm might be over. So the storm, uh, we'll say it starts to break up. Okay, so you've been in slow, steady rain for 24 hours and now it's, you know, it's, it's kind of stopping and you got some cracks between the clouds and you're in this warm, rather humid air. Okay, so now you have to imagine that this thing has gotten to you and it's past you so that now you're in, in this part. 
Okay, you're in this part of the storm. And you've got a gap between when the warm front passes you and the cold front arrives in this sector. And so in this sector, there's probably very little precipitation and you might see some sun, right? It might be, you know, some stratocumulus or, or maybe might almost be completely clear at some point. So I'm going to continue my steps over here. So, and again, we're kind of assuming this is a pretty big, slow moving storm. So we'll say half day to 24 hours of a break. Okay, it looks like storm's over. But then, coming behind all that is the cold front. Okay, now the other thing that's happening too is this low that's been moving is now passed over you. And so pretty soon your barometer is going to start to rise again. So the barometer starts to rise. So again, that mercury column starts going up, right? So in other words, air pressure increases. Then cold front arrives. What's that like? Well, immediate thing that happens, temperatures drop. And we said that along the boundary here of this cold front that you often get pretty severe cumulonimbus. So if I can imagine, let's say I'm looking at this on a satellite loop. And we'll see this in a second. But right behind this cold front, I'd have a bunch of cumulonimbus. And as time goes on, they kind of become less and less frequent, usually. So what's your experience of that? Your experience of that is not a slow, steady rain, but it's raining here and not here. It's raining here and not here. It's raining here and not here. What do we call that in weather speak? Scattered showers. Or if it's snowing, snow flurries. Okay, either one. So when that cold front arrives, we're going to get uh, cumulonimbus. So we'll call that scattered showers. Right? And if it's cold enough, snow flurries. Okay, so that goes by. And now, again, visualize that this whole thing has moved past you and you're now back here in this sector of the storm. Well, if it's a big one, you might get uh, 24 hours or more of this kind of cold, unstable air. So the scattered showers can continue a day and then the next day they're even fewer and the next day they're even fewer. It could be something like that if it's a big storm. Okay, so what happened? So if we kind of keep track here, we had a half day of clouds, a day of rain, maybe up to a day of a break, and then we get a couple days of this cold and stable air with scattered showers, okay? And then this whole thing now is completely by, and you're back here somewhere. And what's back here? Well, what's back there is some really cold air that's coming down from the north, from Canada, let's say. And this is very cold and very stable. Very cold, very dry, very stable. So what kind of weather is that? Clear skies, sunny, but cold. So kind of our last step here, number 10, is cold, sunny, and normally several days of this. Okay. Okay, that is sort of the experience of someone on the ground who is experiencing a mid-latitude cyclone. Now, if everybody in this class was from New England or from Minnesota, 
or from Norway, everybody would understand this because you've experienced it many, many times. The further south you go, the further away you get to the polar front. So what happens as, say, in New Mexico, we rarely get all of these steps. In fact, this is called the Norwegian model. The Norwegian model was formed by these guys in Norway who made a bunch of observations of these mid-latitude cyclones and noticed they formed a pattern. What actually happens where we live most of the time, and you kind of have to think of Okay, let's say this is the Earth, and there's the polar front, okay? So we're gonna mix up air on the polar front, and you're gonna get a cold front and a warm front. So maybe at some particular time, here's the warm front, here's the cold front, right? Something like this. And this thing is moving, you know, it's following basically the polar front and twisting and all that. But here's the thing, where's New Mexico? In this picture, New Mexico might be like right there. So what does that mean? That means that we miss the warm front entirely and we get the tail end of the cold front. So if you lived in New Mexico a long time, you know what this means because in the winter, what do we get? Cold air and wind. And that's pretty much all we get, right? Our winters are pretty dry. Whereas if we lived further up here in that same storm system, they might get, you know, several feet of snow, something like that, because they're closer to that polar front. They're closer to where those two air masses are getting mixed up. We're pretty far from the polar front, so we just kind of get the dregs, right? And then if you get further south, and I probably drew this too far south because it looks, here, we'll draw in a fake equator. Here's my equator, okay? So when you get down, you know, pretty much Mexico and anywhere further south, they don't know what fronts are. They never have them. So fronts are a mid-latitude and higher phenomenon. So in the mid-latitudes and even sometimes up towards the poles, this is where we get fronts. Down here, no fronts. No mid-latitude cyclones. So we're going to go to this website called NASA Worldview. And what it is is they've got um, a couple satellites that sort of travel the, the world like this. So there's always one on the opposite side of the world as the other. And as soon as the footage comes in, uh, they post it on this site. And you can go back in time several years and look at what the Earth looked like. And these black stripes in the middle, you know, the Earth spins faster along the equator than it does at higher latitudes. So the satellites actually miss a little strip right along the equator. And so each one of these stripes is, an, is another pass as it comes over. And they stitch them together here. Uh, but I can, I can look, I can zoom in here. And here is a classic mid-latitude cyclone. Now, that line right there that is an artifact of, of them stitching these satellite stripes together. Because remember, they're going around taking one stripe at a time, and then they have to stitch them together. So there's time that has passed between one side of this image and the other. So if you notice, here's this classic comma shape. And here's another. Here's a smaller one. So these are both mid-latitude cyclones. I'm going to zoom in a little bit here. Not that much. And the low, the center of low pressure would be right there. And the, let's see here, let's go. So you see all this wispy stuff, that's cirrus. Okay, so someone from the ground that's standing over here, this whole thing is spinning counterclockwise and moving to the east. That person would be seeing these cirrus first. And then the cirrus get thicker, and then after that, you can't really tell what kind of clouds you've got, but you go through the sequence we just talked about. So there's our there's our uh, cirrus, and then cirrus stratus is right behind it, alto stratus somewhere behind it. You can't tell from this where the precipitation starts. The nimbo stratus are you know, probably down in, in this part, but you can't really say for sure here. So there's all of the stratiform clouds from the warm front, and then you'll notice there's a sudden break. 
right in here. Okay, and then you'll see that right there are these spots. What are the spots? The spots are uh, cumulonimbus towers. So every one of those spots out in the ocean is a, cow a towering cumulonimbus. In fact, if I zoom in a little bit, uh, these don't show it so well. You can often see the anvils. They're kind of fuzzy. Oh, here's some. So like that's an anvil, and that's the ice from the anvil kind of floating off. So if we kind of look at the big picture, there's cold, dry air coming down this way, mixing it up with warm, humid air coming up from the south. They're mixing it together right along here. That's what's forming the mid-latitude cyclone. That's the warm front stuff. This is the cold front stuff. So this is what's happening along the polar front or all around the Earth all the time. Okay, so here's it. So let's check out this other one here. Okay, so again, you can see there's the cirrus, right? And then they get thicker. And then cold air is behind here. All those, all that spotty stuff, those are all cumulonimbus towers right behind there. If I were to go to the southern hemisphere, let's see here. So here's one in the southern hemisphere. It's spinning the wrong way, right? It's going, it's spinning, it has a clockwise spiral to it. Everything, because of the Coriolis effect, everything's backwards down there. But they're all around, uh, they're all around Antarctica all the time. So here's a uh, satellite loop looking at a mid-latitude cyclone that's going to form right in here. And then we'll see it mature and we'll see it move. So we're going to go uh, one frame at a time here. And so right there, you can see here comes the cold air coming down from the north. There's the warm air moving up from the south. And now they're mingling. And now we get that classic comma shape. That's what mid-latitude cyclones look like when they're mature and the low pressure is somewhere in here. And it wraps around. Now you can see the spiral. That's where the low is. You can see the speckles, those are the cumulonimbus, and this is all the stratiform clouds. And you can see as it, as it spirals, it's also moving uh, to, the, to the east, right? So it's headed towards the continent. And so what, what can happen is, especially over the ocean, the mid-latitude cyclone can spiral and spiral and spiral. So if we tried to draw fronts on this, it would be more complicated than the one that I just drew. The, the fronts would actually wrap all the way around here. Plus you got some occluded fronts in there. So that's what a mid-latitude cyclone looks like as it then matures. Okay, and then it grows on to, we we're back to where we started. Um, also, this is what a mid-latitude cyclone looks like in terms of precipitation. So we're looking at Doppler radar so all these colors are precipitation. And so we don't see clouds here, but the low is kind of centered in here. This is mostly all warm front stuff. So this is that steady rain we were talking about and makes this comma-shaped blob of precipitation. Okay, so that's classic mid-latitude cyclone uh, precipitation pattern. Let's go back to earth.noschool.net again and so last time we were here, we were looking at total precipitable water. And so this is where we are again. And, and again, just making the point that that's a mid-latitude cyclone, counterclockwise rotation. We're bringing up warm, humid air from below, from the south. We're taking cold, dry air from the north, and we're mixing them together. Now, I'm going to turn this around and look at the southern hemisphere. And what I notice is that that's I got clockwise spiral there, clockwise spiral, clockwise spiral. These are all mid-latitude cyclones in the southern hemisphere. And you can see like this one, for example, is bringing uh, warm, humid air from the north, bringing it down and mixing it with uh, cold, drier air from the south. So 
This is happening all the time around the Northern Hemisphere and the Southern Hemisphere. We have these mid-latitude cyclones that travel around in a giant circle where the polar front is. The thing is, during our, let me change, let me go back here. Okay, so now I'm looking at temperature at 700 millibars again. That's the polar front. The storms are going to follow the polar front more or less. So right now, you can see that, let me turn the wind off. You can see that the polar front kind of right today goes kind of right through the United States. So any storms, mid-latitude cyclones are going to kind of come through this way, right? Now, if we came back in the summer and we looked at it in July, uh, we would see that this pool of cold air is much smaller. It'll be way up in here. So let's do a demo of that real quick. So here I've just changed it to look at a day in August. And so you can see the pool of cold air around the North Pole is much uh, smaller than it was a minute ago. So there's the polar front. And from our perspective, it's all to the north of us. So if a mid-latitude cyclone forms, it's going to form along this boundary, which is further to the north than we are. So as far as we're concerned, it doesn't exist, right? So if it doesn't, if it doesn't happen to the United States, it doesn't exist. So in our winter, we have mid-latitude cyclones. So we say winter storms. And then they move further to the north in our summer. We don't notice them at all. But they are still around. And they're not as strong, but they are up here to the north. So one more thing about mid-latitude cyclones. Here I've got a storm that at first looks like a mid-latitude cyclone, but when you look at it, you realize it's missing that slot of cold air that we saw in the uh, previous uh, images, and it doesn't have that uh, characteristic comma-shaped. It is more uh, symmetrical. So this is a hurricane, and hurricanes are structured completely differently than mid-latitude cyclones. So what they have in common is that they have uh, cirrus out on the edges. Okay, that's similar. And they spin counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere. But they, uh, they do their thing completely differently. So for one thing, mid-latitude cyclone means it's not low latitudes, it's not high latitudes, it's in the middle. Uh, hurricanes form at low latitudes. Okay, so there's a, there's a, they're physically in different places on the Earth. Um, let's talk about the structure of hurricanes here. So here we have a hurricane a cross section, and you can think of hurricanes as these organized bands of cumulonimbus. So if this thing were to pass over you, you would have uh, a heavy rain from this band of cumulonimbus and then heavy rain from this band of cumulonimbus, but in between, there's a little breaks. I mean, you're in a hurricane, so break is relevant, but it's the precipitation is decreased in, in between these. Now, that means that air within a hurricane is going up and feeding all of these cumulonimbus towers. All that air going up, some of it has to come back down and it, a lot of it comes down uh, through the eye. So you may have heard that in the eye of a hurricane, you can see the sky, which is true because sinking air fights cloud formations. So when this comes across, you've got relatively low pressure under most of this hurricane, and that kind of sucks the sea up a little bit, called a pressure-driven surge. Um, then there's a bigger effect from the winds that kind of blow the ocean into a pile underneath the hurricane. It's called a wind-driven surge. When this comes ashore, this blob of water comes ashore with it. And that is kind of what we refer to as the surge, and it can flood the coastline. Now, hurricanes uh, form at low latitudes, but they actually don't form right at the equator. And the reason for that is because you need some Coriolis force uh, for the thing to spin. So when we were talking about Coriolis effect, we didn't really talk about this, I don't think, but right on the equator, nothing spins. Okay, so storms don't spin at the equator. You got to be a little bit north or a little bit south to get the Coriolis effect. So hurricanes will spin up kind of right in, around through here in our neck of the woods. And then once they're formed, 
they may drift further north. And in fact, they get into the area that we call the mid-latitudes, right? So mid-latitude cyclones are up in here, and occasionally a hurricane could go far north enough north that it could get into that territory. But hurricanes are pretty much forming pretty close to the equator, a little bit north and a little bit south. In this region that's red, this is the area of the uh, ocean that has the highest sea surface temperatures. And so higher uh, ocean temperatures mean more evaporation, which means more dew point, which means the hurricane is easier to form. It's easier to form cumulonimbus when you have hot, humid air. Okay, so that's er everything we're going to say about uh, mid-latitude cyclones this time. And next time we're going to get into worldwide atmospheric circulation. Thanks for watching.